Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to a new member of our Patreon family, Lisa. Lisa, thank you so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming a member of Patreon, you help us cover the costs of recording, production, and distribution while keeping us relaxed and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. If you're interested in supporting Boring Books for Bedtime and finding out more about the perks available to subscribers, including exclusive episodes heard nowhere else, you'll find a link to Patreon in the show description. You'll also find a link to buymeacoffee.com where you can support us with a one-time tip, no subscription required. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight, for this our 200th episode, let's relax with some cozy thoughts from Cottages or Hints on Economical Building containing 24 plates of medium and low-cost houses contributed by different New York architects, together with descriptive letterpress giving practical suggestions for cottage building, compiled and edited by Arnold W. Brunner Architect, to which is added a chapter on the water supply, drainage, sewerage, heating and ventilation, and other sanitary questions relating to country houses by William Paul Garrard, C.E. Copyright 1884 by William T. Comstock, 6 Astor Place, New York. Let's begin. Preface The aim of this little book is simply to offer a few hints and suggestions to those about to build, or those interested in building, and to present a series of designs of low-cost cottages. These designs were made by request by different New York architects who have turned their attention to the subject. In view of the rapid growth of art ideas, and the great improvement in taste that has taken place during the last few years, it is believed that there is a demand for dwellings reasonable in cost, yet artistic and homelike. Architects whose designs are contained in this book. Mr. William A. Bates, 149 Broadway, New York. Mr. Charles I. Berg, 152 Fifth Avenue, New York. Mr. Arnold W. Brunner, 29 Union Square, New York. Mr. James D. Hunter, Jr., 57 Broadway, New York. Messrs. Rossiter and Wright, 149 Broadway, New York. Mr. Thomas Tryon, 152 Fifth Avenue, New York. Mr. William B. Tuttle, 52 Broadway, New York. Mr. Frank F. Ward, 59 Astor House, New York. And Mr. Fred B. White, 294 Broadway, New York. Cottages, Hints on Economical Building, Chapter 1 
During the past few years, our conception of what a country house should be has entirely changed. Simplicity, elegance, and refinement of design are demanded, and outward display, overloading with cheap ornamentation, is no longer in favor. Naturally, the most expensive houses were the first to get the benefit of the architectural inspiration drawn largely from England. But now that English gables and dormers have spread so widely, now that we realize the beauty of our own colonial architecture and that the Queen Anne craze is subsiding so that only its best features remain, the less ambitious dwellings must not be left to the mercy of those builders whose ideas of beauty are limited to scroll saw brackets and French roofs. It is our intention in presenting a number of designs for country houses to show what can be done with simple means and to give sketches of cottages that may meet the wants of many who desire inexpensive homes which shall be at the same time cozy and picturesque. It must be stated, however, that all we can hope to do in the compass of this little volume is to give some hints on building and offer a few suggestions and ideas which may be of value to those about to build. It is by no means claimed that the drawings here given are sufficient for constructing the houses. Proper working drawings are a much more serious affair and should in all cases be prepared by an architect. This is as important for a cottage as for a mansion. It seems hardly necessary to enlarge upon the importance of an architect's services, since that is now generally recognized. Sensible people, when they are ill, consult a physician and not an apothecary. And when they wish to plan a house, they take the advice of an architect and not a builder. Both apothecary and builder are of course necessary, but they must be wisely directed or they may be dangerous indeed. In this intensely new world, as Matthew Arnold calls it, we have not yet had time to pay much attention to our simpler kind of dwellings. One can say but little for the majority of our cottages beyond that they give us shelter from the sun, rain, and wind. The quaint interest, the great beauty of old European towns are so marked that we would do well to remember that each of the houses in their picturesque old streets was evidently built to suit the special tastes and requirements of its owner. At present, the fashion is set, and while it lasts, all cottages are built to suit. The fashion changes, and the next batch of cottages must come up to the new standard. Now, ready-made houses, like ready-made clothes, may fit but the conditions of house planning are complex and the requirements are many and varied. The house in which we live should have some individuality and not be a mere duplicate of our neighbor's dwelling. We do not care to confess that we are exactly like other people. Of course we are not. We may not wish to be considered eccentric or funny but we do flatter ourselves that we have some ideas of our own. So our home, if it is to be a home, must be planned just to suit our habits. Regarding the exterior appearance, that, to a certain extent at least, will proclaim both the disposition of the interior and its inmates. Now, the intelligent client will of course consult a competent architect, 
but being intelligent, he and Mrs. Client will first talk it all over very carefully, and after discussing the matter thoroughly, will decide upon just what they need. When a decision has been arrived at, they will go to Mr. Architect and tell him their wants, and he will proceed to the best of his ability to solve the problem. The solution he presents in the form of plans, elevations, and sections, which is his way of showing how he intends to fulfill the conditions imposed. But Mr. and Mrs. Client may not find it such an easy matter to decide upon what they ought to have. Building a house is generally a new experience, and many and vexed are the questions that arise. Being a bright, well-informed couple with ideas of their own, they wisely decide to think it out for themselves, and not to tell the disciple of Sir Christopher Wren to make them something real pretty, you know what we want, and we'll call tomorrow to see the drawings. No, they know better than that. It is for them to say what they want, and how it is to be done is the architect's province. So, to help the worthy couple in their deliberations, we will mention some of the points to be considered in building a country home. Only touching upon them, however, for volumes might be, and indeed have been, written on the numberless considerations that present themselves. A little thought and time spent before commencing to build may avoid a great deal of trouble and regret when it is too late to effect alterations. Even when the house is in the course of erection, changes are unduly expensive, as one deviation from the plans is likely to entail another. The superficial knowledge people have of their own houses is often surprising, and it would be well for Mrs. Client to examine critically her present dwelling while Mr. Client takes a few measurements of some of the rooms. This will bring their ideas of dimensions to a more definite shape and greatly aid them to fully understand a set of plans. Chapter 2 The first thing to be decided is where the cottage shall be placed. For a castle in Spain, any picturesque spot would do, nor need we choose it until our castle is quite complete. But for a real house, one that will keep out the cold and keep in the heat, one that will be comfortable to live in and presumably beautiful to look at, one that is subject to many practical as well as artistic conditions, we will proceed to select the prettiest piece of ground in the healthiest neighborhood we can find. Healthy, of course. Better not build at all than make our house the abiding place of malaria, so we will carefully avoid marshy or ill-drained ground. Sandy or gravelly soil is good. Clay is bad. A side hill has many advantages, and affords opportunity for something picturesque. We need not fear it, for a broad trench dug deep as our cellar and running obliquely back of the house will leave us high and dry. If we are sensible rather than ambitious, we will not choose the summit of a hill. Sooner be a little lower down on the slope, securing shelter from the wind and a readier water supply. The question of sight is an important one, and much depends on a wise selection. Even a small lot offers some choice, and a few feet in either direction may avoid damp cellars and future fevers. But if we have a wider choice, 
let us exercise it well and secure a position where we can study nature in her varying moods and enjoy her beauty. Let us be surrounded by meadows and flowers and trees, trees by all means, not too near or we may shut out sunlight and secure dampness instead, but trees are good neighbors and we owe them grateful shade in summer and shelter from winter storms. A stately oak and a few graceful maples, or perhaps some faithful evergreens, will take away the barren and forlorn appearance a house often presents when standing quite alone. A little terracing and grating besides helping to shed the surface water, often give the building the appearance of being well and firmly placed. Care will of course be taken to see that an abundant supply of pure water is obtainable. To decide its quality, a few preliminary borings should be made. Having roughly chosen the position and driven a stake in the site, we must decide in which direction our house shall face. The living room should look to the south or southeast, as they will be cooler in summer, receiving the southern breezes, and warmer in winter, and always cheerful. Next to a southern exposure, an eastern one is best. We must consider how the ground shall be laid out the approaches to the house, position of the public road, and proximity of objectionable neighbors. Our friend Mr. Architect will want to know all this and more too. He will ask you from what directions come the prevailing winds, what is the character of the scenery, and whether there is any choice of prospect, or our pet view will stand in danger of being wasted on blank walls or visible only from the kitchen. Then, after telling him how much we wish to spend, he will be in a condition intelligently to go to work and plan the house. A thorough understanding between architect and client is most desirable. Chapter 3 A history of house planning is the history of civilization, one of the best means by which we can realize the social condition and family life of successive times, says Stevenson in his interesting book on house architecture. The gradual change in the arrangement of dwellings indicates most clearly the development of what we call civilized ideas. In all important houses in the Middle Ages, the hall, which was frequently an immense apartment, was the chief feature. To quote Stevenson again, it was in reality the house, and hence in England, country houses are still called halls. The ends were screened off by wooden partitions, the kitchen at one side, the private apartments at the other. The hall was used as a dining room and sitting room, and the household would sleep there, both tables and beds being movable. Later, the tendency arose to have separate apartments for different purposes and the number of rooms in a house multiplied. In modern planning, strict privacy is essential, and each room must be accessible from the halls and stairways. As soon as a room becomes a mere passage to another, it loses its chief value. The arrangement of a house is, to a certain degree, influenced by considerations of exterior effect. But use and comfort are of prime importance. In the so-called classic houses, 
where symmetry was imperative, convenience of plan was often sacrificed. A well-studied plan is characterized by compactness and the absence of any visible makeshifts or afterthoughts. Everything fits well and seems in its natural place. A rectangular house is the cheapest and best. The octagonal and circular forms are better adapted for bays or projections only. Very irregular and straggling plans may produce picturesque results, but are sure to be comparatively expensive. A square house has always been a favorite with many practical-minded people. It is such a sensible shape and cuts up well into rooms. True, a given length of line as a square encloses a greater area than in any other rectangular form, so we get the most house for our materials and money. Still, we will probably find that after arranging our plan, considering comfort and convenience alone, it will not result in a mathematical square. But if it be compact and capable of being simply roofed, we need not reproach ourselves with undue extravagance. All space occupied in passages and corridors, increasing the size but not the capacity of the building, is wasted. Light and air are, we know, essentials of life. Let us not forget it in planning our house. Dark passages and stairways should not be tolerated. In our cities, where land is very expensive, and the houses which often cover nearly the entire building lot are crowded closely together, many expedients have been adopted to render the inner rooms habitable. Light shafts are used, and rooms often receive only borrowed light by means of glass doors or partitions. In country houses, these methods are inexcusable. Fresh air and the light of day should have access to every nook and corner. Chapter 4 in our modern houses, the hall is generally a mere narrow passage connecting the rooms, and only large enough to contain the staircase. Lately, there has been a tendency to give the hall greater prominence, and as many of the plans in this book show, it may be made a most desirable sitting room by adding a few feet to what before was almost waste space. It may have an open fireplace and some little nook arranged with a seat. The stairs may be partly or wholly screened, a treatment giving opportunities for a picturesque effect. Let us have plenty of light on our staircase and plan it so that even at night one is not liable to stumble. Winders that is to say, steps which radiate at the corners are to be avoided as much as possible, for it is easy to slip on the narrow end. Do not try to have your stairs in a single run. Platforms which should be square form a convenient rest. For ordinary stairs, the risers may be seven and one half inches and treads 10 inches. If the risers are less, the treads must be proportionally greater. The old rule of a 6-inch riser and 12-inch tread is almost too luxurious, and when the risers are less than 6 inches, they become actually uncomfortable and tiresome. If newels are used, as they are in the better class of work, have the tops rounded and let there be no sharp angles that would be disagreeable to the touch. 
The dining room should have an eastern or northeastern exposure so that it may receive the cheerful rays of the morning sun. A western outlook is undesirable, for at sunset the western waves of ebbing day will flood the apartment, making it necessary to close the shutters, excluding the air and leaving the room in darkness. 11 feet in width is sufficient to admit of chairs on both sides of the table, with space for a servant to pass around, but a larger room is desirable. The kitchen should be near the dining room. It may be in the basement, and if the house is on a side hill, this is a good arrangement, as the kitchen may then be entirely above ground. In some of the southern states, it is the custom to separate the kitchen entirely from the house, thereby avoiding all the smell and heat of cooking. It is a good plan for summer cottages to have the kitchen in a wing by itself, even if not disconnected with the rest of the house. In a small house, where the dining room and kitchen must be placed next to each other, a pantry with doors not opposite each other between the rooms will do much to intercept odors and noises. A sitting room or living room should be bright and cheerful. Let it have the benefit of any good view that the situation of the house may command. Give it broad, generous windows, admitting plenty of light and sunshine. Sunshine may not be good for the carpets, but you are not building the house for them, and the health and cheerfulness of the inmates are the first consideration. If carpets will fade, we may use matting, which is now obtainable in good designs and excellent colors. Or let us have good, honest wood floors, oiled or waxed for they need not be very expensive. Then, with a pretty rug perhaps in the middle of the room, we secure greater cleanliness than is possible with a carpet, and need not be afraid of the light of day, two points which should help to decrease our doctor's bills. In providing for light, it is better to have one large window than two small ones a broad casement with a window seat, or a three-sided or semicircular bay with room for a few flowers, or perhaps a small work table and chairs, will be a delightful feature. In the pride of our heart, we may want a parlor or drawing room, as our English cousins would call it. Well, let us have it if we must, for hospitality is a virtue to be cherished. But true hospitality consists in giving our friends what we deem to be our best. Now, a parlor that is kept for state occasions and is such a prim, formal room that everything in it is too awfully nice to touch is not a place where true friendship is likely to flourish. If we need another apartment for our guests, let it merely be an extension of our sitting room. The room we occupy most will be the pleasantest in the house, and we will naturally surround ourselves with the objects we love best. But the spirit of cheerfulness and coziness should pervade the entire house, and the selection we make of books pictures and ornaments will do much towards giving a room a friendly or unfriendly aspect. In a large country house, a separate room for a library is convenient, also a breakfast or morning room, and a billiard room is a luxury to be enjoyed if possible. If we can manage it, a nursery where the children can make a noise and have a real good time without shocking anybody's nerves will be found a great comfort. 
Give the little ones space where they can romp to their heart's content. A large, sunny room with broad windows and a big fireplace. A room with nothing in it that will spoil by contact with little hands. And you will contribute much to their happiness. If we can contrive a little retreat or den in some out-of-the-way corner of the house, it may be well. For although man is a social animal, solitude sometimes is best society. Many of us will appreciate a little sanctum entered by one door only, where we can leave our books and papers, having the sweet satisfaction that they will remain undisturbed. The bedroom should be specially light, airy, and well-ventilated. Space must be left for the bed, a consideration which, if overlooked in the plan, may make it necessary to put the bed in front of a window or against a closet door. The arrangement of doors and windows requires particular attention, and a little care in regard to this will contribute much to comfort. A certain amount of wall surface should always be left, or there will be no place to put the furniture, a fault often found in our houses and productive of much discomfort. Every bedroom should have a closet, and indeed an abundance of closets is necessary, it being hardly possible to have too many of them one for coats in the front hall, one for linen, one for stores, and a good-sized pantry for the kitchen are dear to the heart of a housekeeper. No house should be without a bathroom, large and conveniently located. Care must be taken that the plumbing apparatus is not exposed to the cold or the pipes will freeze in winter. The matter of ventilation and construction of the plumbing work is ably discussed in a separate article devoted to that and other sanitary questions. Chapter 5 Doors are generally hung according to the sweet will of the carpenter, but there are two ways to hang a door one so as to expose the room, the other so as to screen it. The first may be good for the more public rooms, but in regard to bedrooms, the door must swing so that when partly open, they will shield the apartment from view. Closet doors should be hung so that the closet may receive light from the nearest window. Doors are sometimes made to swing out on stair landings or halls, and who has not seen two doors so placed that they strike each other when opened? It is hardly necessary to say that these methods should not be adopted. The question of how to heat a house is discussed at length elsewhere, but from the point of beauty, cheerfulness, and comfort, we must enter a plea for the open fireplace. It may be troublesome to keep clean, although this may be obviated by an ash shoot to the cellar. We admit that an open fireplace is wasteful, as two-thirds of the heat goes up the chimney. But the cheerful appearance, the crackling of the logs, the sparkling embers, the ruddy flames twisting themselves into fantastic shapes, are these worth nothing to us? Contrast a roaring fire of hickory logs, blazing on a broad brick hearth, with the dismal hole in the floor or wall covered with a cast iron register. The cricket on the hearth is a little out of fashion now, and with it has gone the sense of comfort that the broad, picturesque chimney piece always gave. Open fireplaces alone are often insufficient in our climate, 
and furnaces are extremely useful for heating the halls and the house generally. But to rely on their heat entirely excludes one of the features which make home more homelike. The fireplace should be in a position so as to admit of a group sitting around it. It should not stand between two doors, for instance. A little nook or seat may be contrived next to it, making a cozy corner in the room. Chimney stacks can be combined if the house be judiciously planned, and a saving of expense affected. The plans in plate 6, 10, and 17 show how one stag can serve three rooms on the same floor with fireplaces, and in the case of the double houses, all the designs show that this method of saving expense has been adopted. Chimneys must be carefully built of good hard brick, laid in cement mortar, the flue straight and smooth and of uniform size, to allow of better arrangement in the upper floors, the flues may be safely drawn on one side to at least 30 degrees from the perpendicular. There must always be at least 8 inches of brickwork when the chimney stack comes in contact with any woodwork. Every house should have a cellar with stone or brick walls and cement floors and it is of the utmost importance that the cellar be dry. To ensure this, the greatest care should be given to the outside finish of the walls, reversing the usual practice of carefully finishing the interior, and on the exterior, allowing the rough edges of stone to project and form little courses and channels through which the moisture will pass. In case the cellar extends only under part of the house, the rest of the wall should be supported upon brick piers, only filled in between with wooden lattice, giving free access to the air, thus preventing dampness and rotting of timbers. If the reader desires to study construction, or intends to superintend the building of his own house, he cannot do better than consult Mr. T. M. Clark's book on building superintendents. The standard of workmanship that it gives may be a little too high for cheap work. Otherwise, it is an extremely useful volume. Chapter 6 Planning has been called a series of compromises and in fact we will nearly always find it impossible to secure all we desire. Something must be sacrificed, and the best plan is the one that fulfills the most important requirements at the expense of the minor ones. After securing the proper relative arrangement of rooms, their exposure may be wrong, or the chimneys will not combine. We secure an economical combination of chimneys and find that the doors come all wrong and the staircase is crowded to one side. Then the shape of the rooms is ugly. The veranda seems only possible in front of the kitchen. The entrance porch faces the north and there is no way of getting to the cellar. These little difficulties overcome. We find that we cannot get upstairs, and even if we could, the rooms in the upper floors come just as we do not want them, and the hall will be dark. Then we will begin all over again. The amateur must not be disheartened if this is the result of his first attempt to plan a house. The best and seemingly most simple arrangement of rooms is generally the result of the most study. In planning, as in many other things, the simplest is often the best, and what appears so satisfactory and looks as if it were quite the most obvious thing to do, was probably arrived at only after much consideration and thought. 
irregularities in our plan may be turned to account and picturesque and useful features result, but they must come naturally and not be forced, or they will give the appearance of striving to be eccentric. It is a comparatively easy matter to plan a house which is intended exclusively for summer or for winter occupancy, but in those sections of the country where we have successively samples of every conceivable kind of weather, and we wish to build a permanent residence, the difficulties are numerous. During part of the year, we need broad verandas, large windows and doors so arranged that we can get a current of air through the rooms. The heat from the kitchen distresses us, and the refrigerator is regarded with more affection than the fireplace. In a few months, the veranda only serves to shut out the precious sunlight, and double sashes for the windows may be desirable to keep out the cold too easily admitted by the doors. We draw close to the hearth, piled high with blazing logs and rejoice that the slight heat from the kitchen chimney is not wasted on the outer air. Fortunately, what keeps out the heat keeps out the cold, or rather, keeps in the heat, and walls constructed so as to keep the house warm in winter will keep it cool in summer. The veranda is a particularly American feature and should be encouraged, not only because it is American, but because it is a great comfort and a sensible contrivance. Let it be broad and low to keep out the sun's rays. Let it be large enough for plenty of chairs and a work table, and perhaps a rattan sofa or a hammock, and during the long summer months it will be a most delightful retreat. Even in winter, the veranda serves to keep the wind, sleet, and snow from our windows, and so contributes a little warmth if it does rob us of some sunlight. It can be so constructed that it may be enclosed in winter, but it is difficult to heat even if the cellar extended beneath it. Chapter 7 Materials of all kinds have been used for building, but for our purpose, only stone, brick, and wood are suitable, and mud, papier-mâché, glass, iron, and many others need not be considered. Stone is the favorite for all monumental buildings, but it may be occasionally used to advantage in low-cost country houses. If it must be brought from a distance and is to be cut, tooled, and dressed, it will be much beyond the average cottager's means. But when found in the immediate vicinity and laid in irregular courses just as it comes, with the corners squared off only enough to make good joints, we shall get excellent effects without great expense. It is well to use it only for the first story of the house, as shown on plate 12. If cut stone lintels and jams are too costly, we may use brick, either red or buff, selecting the one which harmonizes best with the color of the stone. The doors and windows in this case will be arched and not square-headed. Stone walls need not be very thick. Eighteen inches will be ample, and they need not be damp if properly furred, leaving an airspace. Frequently use large stones, the entire thickness of the wall, as binders, and leave the natural surface as much as possible. Then, if the stones are well selected, we shall have a beautiful surface, whose color, softened by that of mosses and lichens, 
and partly covered by the creeping ivy, will become more beautiful and mellow with age. Brick is a most valuable building material, wonderfully durable, as the remains of the old Roman buildings testify, and fireproof as often demonstrated. To the minds of many, brick suggests all the ugliness of the immense crop of buildings that has sprung up in our American cities. Buildings with wondrous painted and sanded cornices and window caps, with a front pierced with regularly spaced, square-headed openings. But the builder and not the material is at fault. For as countless European examples show us, brick can be used with most excellent effect. Bricks are now made in many shapes, and good moldings can be obtained for cornices, belt courses, etc. Then terracotta, which is nothing more than its name implies, baked earth, or brick in other forms, comes to our aid, and we have ornamental panels, columns, pilasters, voussoirs, and all sorts of architectural finery. For small cottages, we may use brick laid in red mortar, combining it with wood, and perhaps some of the simpler moldings, with a terracotta panel or two to give character to the design. Wood is the material that will commend itself as being the cheapest for building country houses, needing only a light foundation and being easily handled. The old half-timbered houses give us suggestions for a most picturesque treatment. In these buildings, the frame is exposed and filled in with brick or stucco, producing an excellent effect. In the north of France, where rain is abundant, the exposed wood is sometimes covered with slate. This method of construction is adapted to our climate, but brick is better for filling in than plaster or stucco, which is likely to be affected by our severe frosts. Clabbards and shingles are both excellent. The shingles may be cut in different shapes or irregularly laid, giving a variety of surface. Tiles, which are more durable but more expensive, may be substituted. Battened houses, that is, houses faced with vertical boards, the joints of which are covered by narrow strips of wood or battens, are not recommended. And with that bit of advice for the builder of a country home, I think we'll end this evening's reading from Cottages or Hints on Economical Building. I must say that book was surprisingly helpful. I can't think of anything we read there that isn't perfectly applicable today. If you'd like to read this work for yourself and perhaps get some home ideas, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod, or drop me an email via our website, www.BoringBooksPod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night. <laughs>